you hear me? Yeah, uh, we can hear you. All right. Um, so today's class will be an introduction to modular arithmetic. Um, so, Okay, so um, what is modular arithmetic? So modular arithmetic is um, a form of math in which we don't use an ordinary equal sign for our equations. So in ordinary math, we can write things such as five equals five. And this is a perfectly valid statement in regular math because we are stating that the value five is equivalent to the value five. But in modular arithmetic, we use a different system called um, modular congruences. So instead of an ordinary um, two bar equal sign, we use something with three bars here. Okay. And so um, we'll first define what a congruence is. So it's spelled just like you would see in geometry, um, congruence. And Essentially, it's the version of equals, but within modular arithmetic. And we define a congruence between two numbers, A and B. So A would be congruent to B in a certain mod. So we will say mod N, and I'll tell you what this means in a moment. So this statement equivalently means that N will divide A minus B. And so, So our statement here means that n divides a minus b. So I'll give you an example. So for instance, five can be congruent to three mod two because two will divide the expression five minus three. And in fact, this statement of congruences can be interpreted in another way because we can interpret this as the numbers five and three have the same remainder when divided by two because five has a remainder of one and so does three. So over here with A and B, A and B will have the same remainders when divided by N. And that's another way you can interpret what a congruence is. And um, so the best part about mods here is that we have some properties we can um, we can talk about that make mods particularly powerful within mathematics. So um, some properties that we can have with mods is addition. So for instance, if, um, if we have A is congruent to B mod N, then we can have C equals, uh, it's congruent to D mod N. And essentially what this means is that A plus C will be congruent to B plus D mod N. So this is why this is very similar to ordinary math because just like the equal sign, congruences also satisfy these sort of properties. So we can add different parts of equations together and it also makes sense. And we can see this works out because we can take our old example, maybe five is congruent to um, three mod two. And for instance, six is congruent to zero mod two. And adding these will give 11 is congruent to three mod two, which is correct because these both have the same remainder when divided by two and also two does divide 11 minus three. So um, we can see that addition clearly works here with mods and um, but it's not only addition that will work. We can also see that multiplication will work. So if we have these properties, then A times C is going to be congruent to D times D mod N. And um, this is actually a very powerful thing because if we were told to find the remainder of maybe A times C mod N, instead we could find the equivalent remainder of A 
and the equivalent remainder of C, which would be B and D, and multiply these two to get a very simplified expression. So um, these are the basics of mods. And of course, in mods, we still have um, very basic properties hold. For example, um, your reflexive property, we have that A will be congruent to A. And if A is congruent to B, then B is congruent to A. And um, we have all the properties like um, transitivity, associativity, um, commutativity, and distribution. These all work within mods. So um, let's get into a very uh, simple numerical example. This is probably just a computation you would see maybe in a competition, but um, we'll see how we can use mods. So all these numbers you see right here, these are um, quite large and it would be very difficult to compute this number quickly and then divide it by eight to get an answer. But instead of actually computing the entire thing, we can use the properties from mods. So we're looking for 236 times 237 plus 961. And we're going to have this mod eight because we're trying to find the remainder when it is divided by eight. And we're going to find what this is congruent to. So instead of doing this entire thing, we'll do it one by one. So 236 mod eight. If you do the computation real quick, this should be um, four mod eight. And then 237 should be five mod eight. And then 961 would be one mod eight. And so instead of doing these numbers, we simply use what they're congruent to within the mod eight system, which would make it just equivalent to um, four times five plus one mod eight. And if we know this, essentially remember when we do mods, it's just a remainder when we divide it by eight. So this is 21 divided by eight. We have a remainder of five. So um, five mod eight. So our answer for this problem should just be five. So I showed you this really basic example because I wanted you to realize that um, whenever we're doing remainders or we're doing divisibility, um, checking mods because uh, checking mods will be very useful because mods can greatly simplify a problem. And that's essentially what mods are all about, just simplifying a problem so that it's easier to solve and understand what's happening. So I'll go into another example. Um, the last problem, we had some big numbers, but this is a much bigger number. So find the remainder when 36 to the power of 2020 is divided by 37. So um, I'll give you maybe half a minute to think about it, but I think it's relatively straightforward. Oh, and if you have any questions about anything, um, make sure you ask the TAs, um, Will and Brian, and hopefully they can help you um, solve whatever problems you have. Okay, um, so let's approach the problem. So if you've never seen mods before, it might be kind of daunting to see how mods could be used to compute 36 to 20, 20 mod 37. But really what, we're, what we wanna do here is 36, we wanna find what 36 is in mod 37. So um, 36 is congruent to, and now here's the trick, we are not gonna use positive numbers here, but rather we're going to use a negative number. So we're going to say this is congruent to negative one mod 37. And of course, negative numbers, they do work in mods because, um, for example, we have that 37, um, 37 does divide 36 minus negative one. So this is a correct statement. So this is correct. And because multiplication works within mods where we can substitute and it's still congruent, we can do the same with powers. So instead of doing 36 to the 2020, we'll simply be using a substitute, which would be negative one here. So this statement is just gonna mean that 36 to the 2020 is congruent to minus one to the 2020. And this is gonna be mod 37. However, this expression is actually very easy to um, solve because 
this is an even power here with negative one. So this is just congruent to one mod 37. So our answer here is just gonna be one. So um, that's what our answer would be. So um, in this case, the problem was pretty easy because we were given um, 36, which is one less than 37. And we use mods to our advantage here because we were able to convert 36, which is a very big number, to just negative one, which is far easier to handle. So um, we're gonna be going into some probably more difficult um, concepts now. So these are just straightforward computations, but we're going to touch now on solving more probably related to problems. So I have a word problem that I had made up. So here, um, Will has thought of a number X between 15 and 30, and he puts this number into his number machine, which multiplies a number by four and then adds seven to it. And after receiving this new number, Will laughs and he says that when he divides the new number by 15, the remainder is three. And so find what X is. So I'll give you maybe a minute to think about it, maybe um, do some work ahead of time, and then we'll talk about it together. Okay, so I think most of you have either done some work on it or have already gotten the answer. And so we're gonna go through it and introduce a new concept on the way. So um, when we have this number machine, it multiplies four to the number and then adds seven to it. So essentially, since Will has the number X, our expression from the number machine is just four X plus seven. And he says when he divides this new number by 15, the remainder is three. So in terms of the language of modular arithmetic, we can write this as congruent to three mod 15, because when we divide this by 15, the remainder is three. So if we just use regular algebra to solve this, we have that four X is gonna be congruent to minus four mod 15, and this is just gonna be 15 minus four is 11 mod 15. And now the problem is, how are we gonna get rid of this four in front of the X? So the problem with division in modular arithmetic is that it doesn't always work. For example, we have that number 14 is gonna be congruent to six mod eight, right? And if you divide both sides by two, we got seven is congruent to three mod eight. And this doesn't really work out because seven and three don't have the same remainder when divided by eight. And eight does not divide seven minus three. So that's why we can't just do division here. We're gonna to have to think of something more appropriate to handle this. And we're going to look for a way to convert this four into a one. So what number can we multiply by four? Maybe let's say four times some number y is congruent to one mod 15. And just from observation, we know that four times four is 16 and 16 is one mod 15. So in fact, if we use this four, Let's multiply both sides of the equation here by four. So we get um, 16x is congruent to 44 mod 15. And the 16 reduces to one mod 15. So instead of writing 16, we can just write x because it's just one times x. It's congruent to 44, which is congruent to the remainder in by 15 is just 14 mod 15. And so 
um, we know the remainder of x now when divide by 15. It's just 14. So because a number is between 15 and 30, um, the only number in that range, which is a remainder of 14 when divide by 15, would be 29. So we have that x should be equal to 29. And that's how we found x in this problem. And probably the most important section here was realizing this information, was that if we multiplied 4x by 4, we would just get x because 4 times 4 is congruent to 1 mod 15. And so this is an important concept when we're trying to solve um, equations with congruences. And this is an example of what we call a linear congruence equation. Because this is just a linear equation, but with congruences. And so let's try to find a way to generalize exactly how we can do this for any uh, coefficients. This is a specific example. Let's try to generalize it. So um, I'm going to talk about um, inverses. So, so in math, we can define an inverse of just not in modular arithmetic, but rather just um, in regular math, if you have a number, let's say three, the multiplicative inverse we know is one over three because of the property that three times one third is equal to one. Um, but since we can't have this type of division or fractions in modular arithmetic, because everything is an integer, correct? So instead we have to do something more creative with this. So Let's say a number x. So let's say we have a number a and a number x. So x is the inverse of a and congruences if a times x is congruent to 1 mod n for some integer n. And um, x, we usually will write this x as a to the power of minus 1. That's why we write 1 third as 3 to the power of minus 1. So it's the same kind of idea here. So essentially this number X is going to be called the multiplicative inverse of A. And um, so a thing to know about it is we might not always be able to find an inverse of A. So for example, if we're looking at the number three in mod 15, um, you can try as much as you want, but you won't be able to find a number x such that 3x is going to be congruent to 1 mod 15. And that's because 3 is um, a divisor of 15. They share a common factor of 3. So you're never going to find a number where it's not divisible by some part of 15. Um, so we want to know when an inverse exists. In this case, clearly there is no inverse. No inverse can be found. But for other instances, like the problem we had before, the number 4 mod 15 has an inverse, and that's just 4 itself. So we're going to need a way to determine how and when there are inverses to numbers. So there's a theorem that states that um, any integer a, there will be an inverse a to the power of minus one such that um, the inverse property is satisfied. And this happens if and only if a and n are relatively prime, which if you were in the previous week's lesson, means that um, GCD, the greatest common divisor of A and N is one. So they don't share any common factors is what A and uh, is what relatively prime means. So um, I'm not going to go over the details of the proof, but basically it uses an identity called Bazout's identity. And um, this will basically tell you that there exists some number A to the minus one here. And so this, is, this makes sense because in our previous, previous example, when a equals 3 and we're doing mod 15, um, 3 and 15, right, the GCD is not 1. In fact, it's equal to 3. So um, this gives us a good idea of when we are able to solve linear congruences. Because, for example, in our problem, 4x plus 7 is congruent to minus 3 mod 15. In this case, our coefficient was 4. 4 and 15 have a GCD of 1. So it's perfectly OK for us to solve this using an inverse. But if the coefficient had been maybe 5 or 9, these are not relatively prime with 15. So we would not have been able to find a solution for x. 
And um, so that brings up a question because in this case for 15 and four, these are small numbers and we were able to easily guess that the inverse of four was just four itself. But we wanna know um, a method for which we can actually find an inverse to any number. So um, for larger numbers, this can be pretty difficult. So I'm going to first show you with a small number here. We're just gonna do probably just four. So let's take four and 15. So if you were, I think if you were in the last week's Monday lesson, we talked about the Euclidean algorithm. And so we're gonna first do the Euclidean algorithm here. So to find the GCD of these numbers, we just subtract them until there are no more. So this should reduce down to four, if we minus four all the way from 15, we should have three. And then we subtract three from four and we get one and three. So what we did here was we subtracted three times four, and then we subtracted three times one from here, or one times three. So let's say that four and 15, this is our A and our M. So for example, for A mod M. So what we're doing here in Euclidean algorithm is we're subtracting A as many times from M as possible. So in this case, we subtracted four, three times. So our next pair of numbers are a and m minus three a. And then now we subtracted this value three from four once. So our next pair of values were a minus m minus three a, right? And three. And we know that this expression, if we simplify it, is equal to four a minus m. And this is gonna be equal to one because we got one here. So um, we have this equation, 4a minus m equals one. So if we rearrange this so that 4a is on one side, 4a is equal to one plus m, right? And note, if we divide each side by m, we can look at the remainders. So convert this to congruences and we get 4a is congruent to one plus m mod m, but remember, um, m is divisible by m itself. So this is just equal to uh, 4a is congruent to what mod m. And remember our m is just 15, so mod 15. So we are directly given that 4a is congruent to one mod 15. And remember, a is just gonna be four because that's what we defined here with four. So essentially four times four is congruent to one mod 15. So that's how we can determine it via this process that four is the inverse without guess and check. So this, num this trick will work on larger numbers and um, in case you didn't catch it, I'll summarize it real quick. Um, yes, mod m mod n. Um, I was just using the two interchangeably, but essentially what we did was we first just only looked at numbers with four and 15. We did Euclidean algorithm until we had a number one somewhere up here. And then once we have this one, we go back and we use variables to see how many times we actually subtracted each of the numbers four and 15. So we're, by doing this, we were figuring out how we can construct the number one using fours and 15. So that way when we take mod 15, we know the coefficient with four and that'll tell us the inverse. Um, so this method is known as the extended Euclidean algorithm. And in case you didn't fully understand it right now, um, I'm sure there are a ton of videos and explanations online on how this works. But essentially, this is how you can find an inverse for larger numbers without having to guess and check. But for smaller numbers, certainly like for four in this case, guess and check is much, much faster. So you have to pick which battles to use this um, technique on. So um, we've been solving a whole bunch of uh, linear congruences, but now let's look at um, a system of congruences. So in this case, we have something called the Chinese remainder theorem. Basically it tells us that if we have a system of congruences for these numbers m to mn, um, these have to be pairwise with the prime, meaning they share no common factors with each other, then the system of congruences given here will have a solution. So um, I remember when I first learned this theorem, it sounded really particularly useless because 
this theorem doesn't really say anything on how to actually find the solution to the system. It just says that there exists a solution. So um, I'm going to show you guys a process in which you can use to solve a system. And I have an example here, and I'll probably give you guys a minute or two to think about how we can approach this problem. So um, you guys have about a minute. Okay, so um, one thing I should specify is that we're not looking for um, multiple solutions for x. So for example, I already told you x is congruent to 2 mod 5. We're not looking for possible numbers of x. We're looking for something in terms of x is congruent to what mod 35. And why 35? 35 is 5 times 7. And I probably didn't state this clearly enough, but in the Chinese remainder theorem, we're told that there is a solution modulo um, m1 times m2 times all the way up to mn. So basically multiplying all of these mods together. So there will be a solution in that case. And then you can use a solution to find examples of real numbers that do satisfy all of these. So um, I'll probably give you guys another minute or so and we'll talk about how to approach this. Okay, so I think a lot of people have either gotten the answer or have uh, some very good ideas about how to solve this. So the approach we're going to take here is we're going to first take these actually out of modular arithmetic, but into just regular equal signs. So since x is congruent to 2 mod 5, by the definition of a congruence, we know that 5 divides x minus 2. And so we could write that x minus 2 is equal to 5 times some integer, we'll say a. So essentially, x is equal to 5a plus 2, which makes sense because x has a remainder of 2 when divided by 5. And now um, when we do this, we can actually substitute this into our other equation here. So we can take this equation and instead of writing x is congruent to 1 mod 7, we'll take 5a plus 2 as x. So 5a plus 2 is going to be congruent to 1 mod 7. And now this is going to be a linear um, congruence that we can solve, right? We can solve for what a is in mod 7. So let's go 5a is congruent to minus 1, which is going to be congruent to 6 mod 7. And let's find what a is. So to do that, we need to find out what the inverse of 5 is mod 7. And so um, we have several options here. We can either use the method I showed you earlier, the extended Euclidean algorithm, or we can um, essentially guess what this is. But guessing is much easier because if we look at 3 times 5, 3 times 5 is 15, 15 mod 7 is 1 because 15 is just 14 plus 1. So we'll multiply both sides of the equation here by 3. So 15a is going to be congruent to 6 times 3, 18 congruent to 4 mod 7. And 15a, as you said, 15 is congruent to 1 mod 7. So we have a is congruent to 4 mod 7. And 
Same thing we did with this first equation with x congruent to 2. We'll take this back out. So 7 divides a minus 4. So we can write a is equal to some number b times 7 plus 4. So that when a is divided by 7, we have a remainder of 4. And now we know that a is equal to 7b plus 4. So we can plug this back into our expression for x here. So we have that x is going to be equal to 5. Instead of a, we'll take this. So 7b plus 4, and then plus 2. And then this is going to be equal to 35b plus 22. And if you notice here, when we divide x by 35, this term is already divisible by 35, so the remainder is 22. So we know that x is going to be congruent to 22 mod 35. So um, this is going to be our answer to this system of congruences. And this might seem like a lot of work, but um, I actually showed a lot more work than you'd probably need to in a competition. This is just several lines of equations pretty much. And um, this can be easily done with multiple congruences here. I only included two here so that we could save some time, but show you the process. So I think the main trick is just don't be afraid to convert this back into some algebraic forms. And then we can plug that back into congruences and use our modular arithmetic tricks we've learned so far. And so with this, we should be able to solve any system of linear congruences. Um, okay, so does that mean that x is equal to 22? Does that mean that x is equal to 22? x congruent to 22 mod 35 means that any of these solutions will work. We have 22 can work. If you plug 22 in, we see it works. But 22 plus 35, which is 57, also works. Because remember, 57 is just 22 mod 35. And then so on, we can just keep adding 35 and we'll get more and more solutions. So 92, um, 127, and so on. All of these values of x will actually work for the system right here. And so you might see problems actually in competitions that don't state a system like this very specifically. They might ask you and say, um, when a number x is divided by five, the remainder is two. And when it's divided by seven, the remainder is one find um, the sum of all possible values of x in a certain range. And so in that case, you would just convert them to congruences and we can just solve it like this and you can get all possible values of x and just add them in that range or whatever the problem asks for. Um, so now we're gonna talk about um, cycles. So cycles. So um, we've been solving linear congruences so far, but sometimes we want to um, use exponents a lot. So this is a very probably classic problem that many of you have seen in more basic competitions. Find the last digit of 2 to the 2020. So um, ordinarily, people would just approach this by only looking at the last digit. So 2, 4, 8, and 16. We can ignore the tens digit because we're just multiplying the units digit at once, and then 2. And that's probably how people would approach it. And then they see that a pattern occurs because um, what's happening here is when we're finding the last digit, what we're doing is we're just finding 2 to the 2020 mod 10. Because remember, when we take 10, we're finding the remainder when it's divisible by 10, so that's just going to be the units digit. And the trick about exponents in mods is that they will cycle. And you can convince yourself of this because if you were to say that it doesn't cycle, that means that it ends up stuck at one number. And no matter how many times you multiply the same base to it, they'll stay at the number. And you can conclude that only one would work for that. So, um, or there's already been a cycle. So we know that this is going to cycle. And in fact, if we just look at the units digits here, two, four, eight, six, we know that the cycles every four. So two to the one is this, two to the four corresponds to six mod 10. Two to the eight corresponds to six mod 10 again. And so we can conclude that any number 2 to the 4 times k, where k is a positive integer, um, this is going to be congruent to 6 mod 10, just based on pure pattern observation. And we notice that 2020 is divisible by 4, so we have that 2 to the 2020 should be congruent to 6 mod 10. So, um, I think for me personally, using patterns and competitions is perfectly acceptable as a strategy. Um, if you can find a pattern and solve it quickly, 
that's perfectly fine. You don't have to actually know any complicated theorems to solve it. But in some cases, patterns like this aren't gonna be very obvious because either the number's gonna be very large or the, the cycle is going to be incredibly long. In this case, we're fortunate that the cycle for two here is just four, but in other numbers, it might be a lot longer. So there are going to be some strategies that we're going to need to actually um, approach cycles and understand how we can compute a cycle without having to actually compute all the numbers within the cycle. So there are a couple famous theorems, but I'm going to talk about probably the most useful one today. And it's going to, it's going to be called Euler's theorem. Now, um, Euler was a mathematician several hundred years ago with a lot of achievements. So there are probably a lot of theorems named after him, but this is gonna be a very famous one to using competitions. And to do this, we're gonna have to introduce a function called the Totian function. So um, there's gonna be a function phi. This is the Greek letter phi. Phi of n is gonna be our Totian function. And we define this as the number of relatively prime um, integers that are less than n. So um, we'll do a couple examples. For instance, phi of four. So we can list all the numbers less than four. So one, two, three. And one is relatively prime to four. Two is not because they share the same common factor of two. And then three is relatively prime to four. So this is going to be equal to two. And um, I'm going to say that there's a very cool trick regarding um, this Totian function. The Totian function is part of a family of functions we call um, arithmetic functions. And they satisfy this property of Totian of A times B is going to be equal to Totian of A times Totian of B when they are relatively prime. So A and B are relatively prime here. So um, we can check this real quick. So phi of three, if we, numbers less than three is just one and two, both are relatively prime to three. So this is gonna be equal to two. So we should have that phi of 12, which is four times three, is gonna be equal to two times two, which is four. And if we do check this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So one is, two is not, three is not relatively prime, four is not either, five is relatively prime because they don't share any common factors, six is not, seven is, eight is not, nine is not, 10 is not, and we have 11. So one, two, three, four, this is correct. So um, this is probably a very powerful thing when you wanna compute large quotient numbers, but there are other ways to compute this that I will show very quickly. Um, yes. So another remark I want to say is that um, the totient of any prime number P, so P is prime, um, the totient of P is just going to be P minus one. And this is very easy to observe because the numbers we have less than P are just one to P minus one. And since P is prime, it doesn't have any factors besides one and P itself. We have that all of these numbers are relatively prime. They don't share any common factors because the GCD of any of these numbers and P is going to be equal to one. And so um, it's very easy to compute this value for primes. Um, but of course, sometimes with larger numbers, it's inconvenient to have to factor these down and physically count them. So there is a formula which has been proven that can do it for you. So um, this is a theorem. I don't know who proved it, but it's probably quite well known at the time that it was this quotient function was invented. So it's probably by Euler himself. And it states that for any integer n with this prime factorization, so pf is, is gonna be prime factorization of p1 to the e1, so on, where these are all unique primes, they have to be different primes, then we have that V of n is going to be equal to n times 1 minus 1 over p1 and so on for all of its primes. So in the previous problem, we did compute that V of 12 was equal to 4. And we know that 12 is going to be equal to 2 squared times 3 squared. So if we use this formula, we should have that V of 12 is equal to 12 times 1 minus, 
half times one minus a third. And if we do this, we have 12 times one half times two thirds equals four. So um, it's nice verifying theorems when you first see them. And we're going to do an example real quick. I'll probably give you like half a minute because this is just computation. So we're going to compute what phi of 100 is. So go. Oh, uh, yes, my bad. Over here, they're no squared, my bad. Okay, so I think some people probably have already done it and or some people have already had it memorized probably. This is a pretty common um, totient function and I'll show you why in a moment. So let's do this together. 100 can be written as two squared times five squared. So our two prime factors are two and five. So this should be equal to 100 times one minus a half times one minus one fifth. And if we compute this 100 times half times four fifths, this is gonna be equal to 40. So the totient of 100 is 40. And um, that does sound about right because 100 does have a lot of common factors due to the two and five. And so maybe around 60 would share common factors. So um, 40 would make sense from an intuitive standpoint as well. So um, I'm gonna show you why this totient function is related to mods now. So um, I have Euler's theorem here. Um, this is a theorem proven by Euler several hundred years ago. And he states that given two relatively prime integers a and n, so that means GCD, of a and n is equal to one. We have that a to the power of phi of n is gonna be congruent to one mod n. And so um, I'm not gonna show you the proof for this, but I'll explain to you exactly how it works. Essentially, to prove this, we have to look at the factors of a and um, we can pair them with their inverses actually. So if we pair them with the inverses and we count how many there are, it turns out that we have this exponent um, B to the N up here due to like overcount and such, and we can get this to occur. So that's like the general premise of how to approach proving this. And so A to the power of phi of N is congruent to one mod N. And so this is useful because when we were talking about cycles earlier, remember with the two, we had to experiment what the cycle was. But over here, we can clearly see that from A to the zero being congruent to one mod N, this cycles immediately at A to the phi of N it's congruent to one mod n. And so the next, we know that a to the phi of n plus one is gonna be congruent to a mod n. And so we immediately see that the cycle of length phi does exist. And um, this theorem is not to say that there are not smaller cycles that occur, because of course there could be a smaller cycle in here that occurs some number of times until overall it comes back to one again. So, um, this doesn't mean that um, we can use this number, however, if possible. So I'm going to talk real quick about an, a concept known as order. And we're not going to use this concept of order today, but I think it's an important thing to understand. When we define order between two numbers, A and N, let's say order is equal to K. Then A to the K is congruent to one mod N and no smaller value of K. So there's no value smaller than K where this holds true. So K is the smallest exponent in which a cycle occurs. That's, ex that's essentially what order is. And um, we write this as, I think, order of N A. And there's a cool property because we know that this is a cycle and we know that there's a cycle here. Thus, if this is the smallest cycle, there's a number of cycles that appear until this occurs. So we know that this order has to divide phi of n. So essentially, if you were given a problem in which you had to find maybe the smallest exponent in which a cycle occurred, you would know where to start looking because you can compute easily phi of n, and then you can look at the divisors of phi of n and start testing them or maybe using some other tricks to see which one holds true. Um, so now let's go to an example of um, how to use phi of n in a problem. Um, so 
when I first looked at these problems and I had learned Euler's theorem, I was pretty excited because it's actually kind of cool how we can do this. So we're asked to find the last two digits of 17 to the 122. And I'll give you guys probably around two minutes or so to try this out for yourself. Um, I remember when I first did these type of problems, I didn't know how to do them. So I'll just type them into a TI Inspire and it's actually capable of computing very large numbers. So then I would just cheat like that. But of course, once you learn Euler's theorem, there's no need. Okay, um, in case some of you haven't understood how to approach this yet, the method we're gonna use to approach this is gonna be, we're gonna try to find this mod 100 because when we divide by 100, the remainder left is just gonna be the last two digits of any number. So we're looking for 17 to the 122 um, mod 100. Okay, um, I'm gonna go over how to do this. So you can follow along or you can compare whatever results you had gotten. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna first make sure we can actually use Euler's theorem here. So this is a very careful thing when using theorems, always make sure that whatever you're using it on satisfies the given conditions of Euler's theorem. So if you go back to Euler's theorem, we will see that um, we need them to be relatively prime integers a and n. So the GCD is basically equal to one. So let's go to our palm here and we can check that 17 and 100 are indeed relatively prime because they share no common factors. And that means that we are good to go for Euler's theorem. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're gonna find a way in which we can find cycles within this exponent 122. And if, in fact, if we use Euler's theorem, we know that 17 the phi of 100 is going to be congruent to 1 mod 100. And from the previous example we, I just gave you, phi of 100 is equal to 40. So we know that 17 to the power of 40 is going to be congruent to 1 mod 100. And so since we're given this, we know that every time we have this 40, it's just going to repeat back to one, essentially 17 to the 40 cubed is going to be congruent to one mod 100. And this is just 17 to the 120. So we're just missing two 17s now. So essentially 17 to the 122 is going to be congruent to um, 17 to the 120 times 17 squared. And 
Remember, this is congruent to 1 because of Euler's theorem, so this is going to be congruent to just 17 squared mod 100. And this is very easy to compute because 17 squared we know is 289, so we have that this is congruent to 89 mod 100. So the last two digits are going to be 8 and 9. And um, this is a very quick way actually just to find the last two digits, but sometimes for problems, um, we're not given such lenience with how the exponent appears. In this case, I gave the number 122, which just happened to be um, 120 plus 2. So that's very easy to compute. But in some instances, you could get a number maybe like um, 140. So we'd have to actually compute what 17 to the 20 mod 100 would be. And unfortunately, there is a way to do this. Um, not the quickest way, but it's better than having nothing. So... Um, I'm going to show you a method real quick to compute mods very quickly for exponents without using cycles. So let's look at 17 for an example. So with 17, what we're going to do is if we're looking for 17 to the 20. We can do 17. It's congruent to 17 mod 100. And then 17 squared is congruent to 89 mod 100. And then 17 to the fourth, it's going to be congruent to, here, we don't need to actually compute 17 to the fourth. Remember, we're going to just do 89 and square 89 instead. So um, 89 squared should be equal to, um, let's see. Okay, 8, 9, 21. So the last two digits should be 21. Um, correct me if, I'm wrong, but we should have this. And then instead of finding other powers like 17 to the sixth, we can just directly go to 17 to the eight and just square 21. So 21 squared is 441. So 41 mod 100. And then we can square 41. So 17 to the 16 is congruent to 41 squared should be, I think 1681. So that's just 81 as the mod mod 100. So um, we can actually stop here because remember, we're looking for what 17 to the 20 might be mod 120, uh, mod 100. And so instead of finding actual values and multiplying them, instead we can build up 20 using powers of two. Essentially, we're writing 20 in terms of binary. So 20, remember, is equal to um, two to the four plus two squared. So we'll just look at the powers of two to the four and two squared. So 16 and 4, and we just multiply 21 and 81 to get what this value is. So I'm not going to compute it, but essentially that's what we would do. And if we were asked for maybe 17 to the 27, for example, 27 is equal to 16 plus 8 um, plus 2 plus 1, I believe. So we would use 17 to 16 multiplied by 17 to the 8 multiplied by 17 squared and then multiply by 17. And that way, we can minimize how many computations we need to find it. OK. So um, let's see. Um, we have a bit of time left. I'm going to just quickly summarize what we've done today. So um, in summary, modular arithmetic is just the idea of converting math when we're relating to remainders and divisors to a system of linear and nonlinear congruences. So we use systems of congruences to represent the ideas of divisibility and remainders. And um, this is convenient because we use modular arithmetic as a tool primarily to simplify problems um, to ways we can understand and solve them more easily. So for example, with divisibility, we can just analyze them mod whatever your divisor is, so mod a divisor. So um, simplifying. And at the same time, we can also use mods to um, quickly find um, remainders with larger numbers and um, so with exponents. And here we primarily talk about cycles and also Euler's theorem. So if Euler's theorem can't work, try cycles, try the method I just showed you with um, calculating exponents quickly and see if there are any patterns. And 
that's probably your best bet on solving high exponent problems with um, computation. And then also we talked about solving systems of congruences. So here, um, CRT, um, Chinese remainder theorem, will tell you that there exists a solution. So there exists a solution. But to find it, you'll need to use the substitution technique we used with also solving congruences in between. And um, we're also talking about inverses today. So inverses to numbers and um, mods, they only exist when they're relatively prime. And inverses are useful because we use them to solve systems, to solve um, congruence equations and so on. And um, that's pretty much it. And primarily, in my opinion, um, modular arithmetic and number theory is um, not very highly aimed at the AMC and even like the beginning AMI level. Um, problems in number theory usually will be more related to factorization, um, counting how many possible ways something can occur. So um, the, number of way, the number of problems you'll actually see like direct uses of mods on might not be that much, but knowing mods and being able to use them very efficiently will save you a lot of time in solving these problems. So um, I think with mods, when you understand a deeper level of them, they're not perfectly applicable to quick computation competitions, but rather more towards like proofs and more difficult problems. And um, I think that'll conclude my class today. If you have any questions, you can ask them real quick and I'll try to answer them or my TAs will. And um, you guys are free to leave now. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, if you guys have any questions that you can think of after the class, um, feel free to send them on the Discord or our newly uh, created AOPS forum and we'll try to get you on there. Yeah. Bye guys. Thanks for coming once again. Yeah, thanks for coming. I'll end this um, video in around a minute. So ask any questions if you have any. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. Okay.